This conference will now be recorded. Good afternoon, everyone. Once again, I welcome you all to Webby Care 2020. So even though difficulties, we are still continuing with the regular classes. Uh, today we are having discussion on hospital, aqua, hospital and ventilator acquired pneumonia. So we have a esteemed speaker now, Dr. Avinash R, consultant pulmonologist, Apollo BGS Hospital, Mysore. I uh, say special thanks to Dr. Avinash. In spite of the, you know, uh, difficulties in managing patients there. So even though there is a quite busy uh, in all ICOs, Dr. Avinash agreed to have this class and continue this class. So thank you so much, Dr. Avinash, for your valuable time. Uh, it will be very much helpful to the, all the students. So I request Dr. Avinash to proceed further. Uh, thank you, Avinash. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you very much for making me a part of uh, Web Critic, and thank you for providing me an opportunity to speak here. Uh, yes, definitely, it is a very uh, testing times for everyone, and uh, with all this COVID and other things going on, uh, we are constrained by times, constrained with time and it requires a lot of effort in order to go through everything and first and foremost i would like to thank everyone here for joining the meeting and uh, i hope that whatever i am trying to tell i'm just trying to give an outline as far as possible okay outline as far as possible and i am uh, always open for questions so you can ask me any questions at the end okay this is not very exhaustive I've just tried to highlight only the practical aspects so that we get to know what needs to be done. And uh, this is basically a practical thing that I'll be trying to do now. Mm -hmm. Okay, so with this, I'm starting over with a presentation about hospital and ventil ventilator acquired pneumonia. I'm Dr. Avinash Ar. I'm a consultant pulmonologist at Apollo BGS Hospital. So, so first and foremost, I'll be dealing with, uh, uh, with, the, with this topic in the following headlines. Okay, first would be the definitions epidemiology, pathogenesis, microbiology, prevention aspect, diagnosis. I'll try to provide a treatment algorithm as such and some take home messages. So basically what is pneumonia? Okay, pneumonia is one common term with this COVID on the rise, everyone speaks about pneumonia. So pneumonia basically means inflammation of the lungs, okay, or inflammation in the lungs with the accumulation of mucus. I'm very sorry about this. So pneumonia is basically inflammation of the lungs with accumulation of mucus uh, or pus in the air sacs and uh, which ends up making the lungs solid. So basically making the lungs solid is nothing but consolidation. Consolidation as we all know, the, what happens is the consistency of the liver, uh, lungs almost becomes similar to the consistency of the liver. So this is consolidation or hardening of the lungs. So along with this, uh, what happens is based on that one, we have different types of pneumonia. Okay, I'm facing some lag here. Okay, there are different types of pneumonia. Based on the uh, anatomical extent, you can either have a lobar pneumonia where one lobe is involved, either the right upper lobe, middle lobe, lower lobe, left upper lobe, left lower lobe, or the lingular pneumonia. There might be segmental involvement, uh, say only the upper lobe pneumonia or one segment that is involved. And they might be bronchopneumonia where the pneumonia is extensive and involves both the sides. Okay. And this is not a single entity. And there might be what was uh, initially a uh, bronchopneumonia can turn into a segmental pneumonia and segmental pneumonia can turn into a lobar pneumonia. That's what based on the anatomical aspect we get to know. One. Second thing about uh, the pneumonia thing is whatever consolidation is done, you'll have to differentiate between a consolidation and a collapse. When you have a segmental pneumonia, you'll have to differentiate that from a collapse. So in collapse, what happens is there's loss of lung volume. In consolidation, that lung volume is preserved. So this is about the anatomical uh, categorization of pneumonia. Based on microbiology, the pneumonia is a bacterial pneumonia, a viral pneumonia, a fungal pneumonia, sometimes a parasitic pneumonia, okay? And depending upon the place of infection, you end up categorizing pneumonia into either a community acquired pneumonia, a hospital acquired pneumonia, or a ventilator acquired pneumonia. And there is one more entity called as healthcare associated pneumonia. See, even though this is a categorization based on the place of infection, it 
I can rather end up telling it. It is the microbiological classification itself. Because your community acquired pneumonia, you have a different set of organisms which end up uh, giving uh, causing an infection. Your hospital acquired pneumonia has a different set of organism causing an infection. And your ventilator associated pneumonia has a different set of organism causing an infection. So based on this one, that is microbiological differentiation between the different uh, sorts of place of infection pneumonias. And along with that, there are patient factors also. On a person on a ventilator is already critical. He is having a lot of infection. It, he might be in sepsis. He might be having multiple organ failure, so the prognosis is bad. So with this, I'm coming to the definition. My slides today will be based on your IDSA 2016 guidelines. Okay, so fine. Hospital acquired pneumonia or nosocomial pneumonia is the pneumonia that occurs 48 hours or more after admission, and it did not appear to be incubating at the time of admission. Each and every word here is very very important. Nosocomial, uh, nosocomial pneumonia is nothing but hospital acquired pneumonia. Usually what happens a patient comes to the hospital he gets admitted to the hospital and you do an initial x-ray you have a look at all those things and uh, then you see okay there is no patch or anything he is admitted for something else okay subsequently after 48 hours he ends up having a pneumonia okay he ends up having a pneumonia you have a look at the x-ray you end up seeing a patch and 48 hours later if there is a patch then you can consider a possibility of hospital acquired pneumonia provided he was not incubating at the time of admission so this is one thing second thing is wap or ventilator associated pneumonia is a subset of hospital acquired pneumonia only the people who are on a ventilator after getting admitted to the hospital okay usually develop a ventilator associated pneumonia wap is a type of pneumonia that develops more than 48 hours after endotracheal intubation so 48 hours is very important there is one more differentiation here. WAP can be told as early WAP and late WAP also. On early WAP will have organisms which are similar to hospital acquired pneumonia or community acquired pneumonia, and a later WAP will have a more uh, MDR organisms as such. There was one more entity of pneumonia called as healthcare associated pneumonia. It was first told in 2005 uh, ATS IDSA guidelines. Basically, it was done in order to tell uh, that identify patients who are at risk for infection with multi drug resistant pathogens so their definition goes this way pneumonia acquired in healthcare facilities such as a nursing home hemodialysis center outpatient clinic or during hospitalization within the past three months so as of now in the 2016 IDSA guidelines they have removed this definition and they have found that it is not very useful to get to know that these patients might be infected with multi drug resistant pathogens okay now coming to the epidemiology i'm not going through the details of all those things hospital acquired pneumonia is most common uh, is one of the most common hospital acquired infection see hospital acquired infection if any person develops a fever or some sort of an infection in the hospital we end up thinking of three things one is a urinary tract infection that might be the most commonest as such second is we check for all the lines any peripheral lines central lines any uh, catheter induced in, uh, induce infection sort of a thing and third important one would be hospital acquired pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia if i have to tell it is the most serious of the other other three types and and uh, hospital acquired pneumonia usually occurs in non-ventilated patient if it occurs in a ventilated patient then we tell it as a ventilator associated pneumonia there has been a lot of progress that has happened over time in order to reduce the incidence of hospital acquired pneumonia and ventilator acquired pneumonia these are changes with regards to patient management patient care and uh, adequate suctioning mucolytics and other things so thereby what has happened is initially when this entity was coined in 2005 and subsequently till now the incidences which were almost uh, 20 to 30 per thousand cases so it has come down to a huge huge extent so pathogenesis and why do hospital acquired pneumonia happen so coming to the pathogenesis there are two factors which we'll have to think one is the organism factors second is the host factors see organism factors are very very important and it depends upon the number of organisms and it depends upon the virulence of the organism okay i'll go through that one in the next slide so the subsequent other factors are host factors in host factors basically can be divided into three and any infection per se any uh, colonization to get converted to an infection depends upon the host immunity your immunity 
can be mechanical immunity. Mechanical immunity, as you tell, our respiratory system has a number of mechanical barriers as such, right from the vibrissae in the nose and the mucus in the nose to the vocal cords, which end up closing uh, and not allowing any foreign body to almost all your epithelial lining that is there in your uh, lower respiratory tract, the mucus that is there, uh, and the ciliary action. All those things uh, contribute to mechanical immunity. Your humoral immunity and your cellular immunity are based on your alveolar macrophages that are there, which ends up scavenging any particles that are there, food particles or any uh, uh, scavenging all the viral elements, bacterial elements, any foreign bodies, any irritants, any pollutants, any allergens that come into the respiratory tract. It ends up removing that one. And humoral factors is you have a lot of uh, soluble immunoglobulins there and the IgA and IgE basically so the they contribute to your immunity and second thing is your when the immunity is on the lower side there is a breach of the mechanical barrier or the uh, pathogen ends up reaching your alveolus gets embedded there and then embedment and invasion subsequently leads to an infection so coming to comorbidities comorbidities can be systemic or local okay systemic comorbidities basically is anything that suppresses your immunity See a chronic diabetes mellitus, which is not under control, a chronic renal failure, uh, liver related issues, or even your, uh, in cases of our COPD hmm, or your lung related issues or any malnutrition, hypoalbuminemia, which suppresses your immunity, one. And second thing is all your local factors. Local factors from can be right from the nose till your lungs, okay? Local factors is if the person has a DNS, then he's prone to have recurrent allergic symptoms and allergic symptoms, stasis of secretion can lead to an infection. Your sinusitis can also lead to a lung related infection. Your poor oral hygiene, like in the form of a uh, caries tooth or something, or if you have some oral hygiene related issues, you are prone to have organisms which are pathogenic and they can get aspirated into the lungs. Okay, or even in your lungs, there are changes that happen like in the case of bron bronchiectasis, cystic fibrosis, where there is structural alteration in the lungs and this structural alteration basically leads to colonization and this colonization over time when your immunity is on the lower side or the virulence of the organism on the higher side can lead to an infection, okay? And there are other factors like colonization factors and oral hygiene factors, which I ended up mentioning just now. So colonization factors, anything, basically you go end up going somewhere, you end up taking all those organisms because air is a barrier. The air freely moves from the environment to your lungs and we can't stop breathing. So there are there is an entry and exit of air that happens and along with that organisms come in and go out. So this can be prevented if our immunity is on the higher side. And once our immunity goes down, it leads to colonization and later to infection. So the pathogenesis, what I'm trying to tell is, uh, basically every one of us aspirate. Hmm? Every one of us aspirate, whatever is there in our mouth, our saliva, and including all the organisms that are there in the oropharyngeal cavity or in your gastrointestinal cavity, we end up aspirating it. So the aspiration is almost what you own that 45% of every one of us, okay, aspirate in small quantities during sleep. So once our immunity is fine, our cellular and humoral immunity is fine. So these do not cause an infection. But when our immunity is on the lower side, they cause an infection. So here yeah, when I telling about aspiration, oropharynx is more than GIT. So I've gone through some studies with regards to gastrointestinal tract and all our PP prophylaxis, all our uh, antacid related prophylaxis, what we end up doing it. Uh, they have been studies which tell that gastric sterilization basically leads to uh, some amount of aspiration and some amount of uh, pneumonia related aspects also. So we'll have to be very, very careful when we are giving a proton pump inhibitor I think so H2O blocker will be much better and we'll have to encourage people to go in for enteral nutrition as soon as possible. So the second thing is endotracheal tube partially facilitates aspiration. Uh, one of the indications for putting an endotracheal tube is basically when you are have, in order to protect the airways, in order to prevent an aspiration. Though it helps to keep up with that one to a huge extent, it also partially facilitates aspiration. So usually what happens is there is some amount of leakage of secretion in the pericuff area around the endotracheal tube, around the cuff area. There will be some amount of aspiration that happens, one. Second thing is there is a predisposition towards a biofilm formation inside the tube and also outside the tube. So basically when a person is on endotracheal tube, what we do is suctioning. When we do a suctioning, when we are pushing into in a catheter there, 
we end up dislodging that biofilms into the lungs and that biofilm acts as a very very good protection to the microbes which are there inside the biofilm and they don't get affected by antibiotics so it it forms as a source of colonization okay that is right third is hospital acquired micro microbial colonization so there were studies which suggested that around 75 percent uh within 48 to 72 hours of hospitalization around 75 percent of the people have uh, colonization from hospital microbes so the colonization is okay but as i told you when the immunity is on the lower side when an infection happens then we tend to have pneumonia the other aspect is contaminated respiratory devices or water sources this was a cause of concern initially when you are using the number of respiratory devices right from your nasal prongs to a mask to an your niv mask or even to your nasopharyngeal area, laryngeal airway or your endotracheal tube a contaminated respiratory device your suction catheter a contaminated respiratory device can facilitate uh, easy ingress of microbes into the lower respiratory tract and also contaminated water sources and here one important factor is personal factor personal factors are we medicos doctors and staff nurses who are taking care of the patient if we are not following proper hand hygiene and we are not changing the glove we are touching one patient after the other we are especially handling all those respiratory devices when the patient is intubated or anything as such we become as a best vector for transmission of infection from one patient to the other patient so personal factors are also very very important and stress ulcer prophylaxis as i told you stress ulcer prophylaxis what happens is a gastric acid forms a uh, micro free area when we end up giving prophylaxis for stress ulcers basically so what we suppress uh, we suppress the acid production increase the ph and thereby we reduce uh, reduce the sterility of the gastro uh, gastrointestinal content and when they end up aspirating that one we might end up having pneumonia so coming to the microbiology your hospital acquired pneumonia or your ventilator acquired pneumonia acquired pneumonia uh, based on microbiology can be monomicrobial and usually it is polymicrobial and not monomicrobial the commonest pathogens for your uh, hospital acquired pneumonia are your gram negative and gram positive organism there were studies which you end up telling that gram positive organism especially mssa is more than mrsa and also streptococcus species are also seen and gram negative organism like the pseudomonas we, i just termed it as park because we don't like pakistan so it is pseudomonas it's not a factor and klebsiella and other than that there is escherichia and enterobacter so those are your gram negative organism gram positive organism you have your methicillin sensitive staph aureus and methicillin resistant staph aureus and also your streptococcus species the other three things it is usually not seen so prominently because it is based on your culture methods see basically anaerobes we don't do an anaerobic culture and so though anaerobes may form a huge part of your hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator acquired pneumonia but we don't get to know because we don't do specific anaerobic culture methods or we don't do a viral culture methods also on that so viruses can also lead to your hospital acquired pneumonia or ventilator acquired pneumonia but it is usually undetermined and coming to the last thing that is fungus fungus usually what happens is whenever we end up doing a uh, mini ball or we end up taking a sputum sample we send it for testing or endotracheal aspirate and send it for testing we usually end up uh, finding out it is a candida species so here we have to be very very careful whether it is a colonization versus an infection when our immunity is on the lower side especially in a diabetic your sputum samples and other things which turn out to be having candida they are not infection they might be colonization and candida species is also very important because they can also cause invasive uh, candidiasis too so just a, a table summarizing uh, uh, what is the commonest organism coming to hospital acquired pneumonia i will go to the right side first hospital acquired pneumonia the commonest organism is staph aureus mssa accounting for 13 percent mrsa accounting for 20 percent among the other organism pseudomonas aeruginosa is nine percent streptococcus altophila uh, Stenopomonas maltophila is around 1%, Escherichia factor uh, constitutes around 3%, and other species constitutes around 18%. When you come to ventilator acquired pneumonia, again your MSSA and MRSA occurs, uh, accounts for almost 9% to 18%. Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Here, what we have to see is Pseudomonas aeruginosa is also on the higher side. 
uh, your uh, cephalo coccus is almost similar pseudomonas erythrinosa is on the highest right you have your uh, xenophomonas uh, maltophila almost seven percent Esnetobacter is also on the higher side. So whatever uh, treatment protocols that we end up putting it later depends upon what organism is usually present. One according to this study. Second, it all depends upon our local antibiogram. Uh, depending upon our local antibiogram, uh, we can select appropriate antibiotics in order to cover it. And whatever antibiotics we end up using it, it has to cover our Staphylococcus also has to cover Pseudomonas erythrinos also. It may have to cover Esnetobacter species also. So coming to the risk factors, and see we already uh, looked into aspects with regards to what is the causative uh, factors for this and what is what are the microorganisms also. So coming to the risk factors, these are risk factors for MDR pathogens uh, which uh, uh, and or increased mortality in patients with hospital acquired pneumonia. So risk factors for increased mortality. See, basically, uh, a person with pneumonia, hospital acquired pneumonia, if he is supposed to have an increased mortality, then usually the patient's condition when it deteriorates, we'll have to put him on ventilatory support, ventilatory support for hospital acquired pneumonia. And if the person has sepsis and septic shock, they contribute as a risk factor for mortality. Risk factors for MDR pseudomonas or other gram negative vasculae or MRSA. IV antibiotics within the past 90 days. So initially when a patient comes to us and we are supposed to ask along with all other histories and we are supposed to ask that has the patient taken any IV antibiotics over the past 90 days and we as clinicians what we end up doing is whenever we put our discharge summary and whenever we go through the discharge summary of other hospitals so we find a few flaws because it is a flaws that what we are doing and when we give a discharge summary, we give up and we write everything and like patient was treated on IV antibiotics, nebulization, bronchodilators, mucolytics and other agents. But we don't mention what IV antibiotics was given at that time and how many days was it given. If we mention that one, subsequently when that uh, wheel turns around and the patient comes back to us, we at least have some idea about what IV antibiotics was given during the last admission. So this is one factor that we'll have to take care in our discharge summary so that it is beneficial for us later or for some other person who is looking into this aspect. Okay, so risk factors for MDR pseudomonas or other gram negative vascular and MRSC is IV antibiotics within the past 90 days. Again, risk factor for MDR pseudomonas and other gram negative vascular can be structural lung diseases. As I mentioned you, all those risk factors, structural lung diseases either in the form of a bronchitis or cystic fibrosis, a respiratory specimen gram stain with numerous and predominant gram negative bacilli. I'll come to this one later. Colonization and or prior isolation of MDR pseudomonas or other gram negative bacilli in the previous culture. Okay, in the previous culture. Okay, and risk factors for MRSC in a hospital acquired pneumonia is if you have in your hospital, if uh, you ask your microbiologist that how many samples of staph aureus was isolated with, with all your respiratory samples. And in them, how many were MRSA and how many of them were MSSA? So treatment in a unit in which more than 20% of staph aureus isolated are methicillin resistant. Treatment in a unit where the prevalence of MRSA is not known or colonization and or prior isolation of MRSA. This becomes very important. Now, risk factors for multidrug resistant ventilator associated pneumonia. This is for ventilator associated pneumonia. pneumonia. The previous one was for hospital acquired pneumonia. Risk for MDR pathogens for VAX. So IV antibiotics used within the last 90 days. Septic shock at the time of ventilator associated pneumonia. Yeah. ARDS that was uh, ARDS that was preceding VAX. Hello, Avinash. Avinash, you are not audible.
Avinash? Associated pneumonia. So, first and foremost, Hello, Avinash. Hello. Yeah, you are not audible for few seconds. Ah, uh, for few seconds. And I only tourist or the audio disconnected, Anta. So okay. Adi kena na. That's Easter. No problem. No problem. Now it's connected. Uh, okay. Okay. Hello, Avinash. Hello. Yeah. Uh, sir. No, sir. Uh, this is Anup. Uh, I think there is some lag he's facing, so he'll be connecting. Sir. Okay. 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 Hello. Yeah, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm uh, talking is it? Ah, la, la. audio banto matte. I thought the birthday then I know slideshow haki touch another hope that then. One second, hagging. Hmm. I'm just giving. Ignore the alle. Some current side. Banto. No, sir, it is working. You can carry on. I can carry on. Okay, huh? yeah. thank you. Okay. Coming to the risk factors for MDR associated pneumonia, risk factors for MDR pathogens. Okay, risk factors for MDR pathogens. What we need to uh, think about is the uh, uh, I think the time of ventilated pneumonia. As I told, ventilator associated pneumonia occurs 48 hours after your intubation. So, if there is septic shock at the time of ventilator associated pneumonia, usually tells that the infection is severe and it might be MDR pathogens. ERDS, that is preceding VAP. Okay, uh, ventilator associated pneumonia is that patient is already on ERDS. You have ended up diagnosing ERDS. Then the patient has new infiltrate. I'll come to the categorization of clinical phases of how you come for ventilator associated pneumonia. ERDS preceding VAP. Can be because of MDR pathogens. More than five days hospitalization prior to the occurrence of VAP. Okay, the patient has been in the hospital for almost five days, and after that, one patient has got intubated, and patient has got intubated, and he has developed ventilator associated pneumonia. Usually, the pneumonia will be hospital acquired, or the organism will be hospital acquired, and uh, it might be MDR pathogen. And acute renal replacement therapy prior to VAP onset. Usually, patient is. in sepsis septic shock requiring a renal replacement therapy then he got intubated then a ventilator acquired pneumonia you will he'll be having an mdr pathogen so in this mdr pathogen if it is pseudomonas or other gram negative backline depends upon our local antibiogram here uh, as an mrsa you see 20 percent here is treatment in icu in which more than 10 percent of the isolates 
gram negative isolates are resistant to an agent being considered for monotherapy. So usually we end up starting a monotherapy using a third generation cephalosporin uh, if the patient is stable and we go for a higher antibiotic if the, if the patient is unstable or has a very severe infection. So considering this one, if it is more than 10% of the gram negative isolates are resistant to that monotherapy, third generation cephalosporin or some other uh, drugs also, then there is a possibility of pseudomonas. Treatment in an ICU in which local antimicrobial susceptibility rates are not known or colonization or prior isolation of MDR pseudomonas in the previous uh, cultures. MRSC is again the same. If there is uh, of the isolated staph aureus, if more than 10 or 20 percent are methicillin resistant and in a treatment union in which the prevalence of MRSC is not known or colonization or the so these are risk factors which we have to think this table is very very handy so that we will we will be able to at least go through this table when needed okay so like going to and the management there has been a lot of things what has been done correctly over the past so many years which has reduced the incidence of ventilator associated pneumonia and hospital acquired pneumonia and some of the basic practices that are being done i'll just try to highlight them so uh, basic practices that are being done is usage of non-invasive positive pressure ventilation in selected population. If you're not putting a tube, then definitely you're avoiding back. So the more you postpone putting them a tube, put them on NIV, I think so. Uh, yeah, the quality of evidence of the chances of developing ventilator associated pneumonia will be low. Manage patients without sedation wherever possible. When the patient is very restless, not synchronizing with the ventilator, or we end up uh, requiring high beeps, which becomes uncomfortable for the patient, we sedate the patient. Only. And try, trying to manage a patient without sedation and trying to reassure the patient and manage the ventilator settings in accordance to the patient's respiratory efforts is very important. So manage patients without sedation wherever possible. Interrupt sedation daily. So this is a practice that is done in all ICUs. Early in the morning, they stop the sedation, look for patient improvement, and they end up stopping sedation in between, and it doesn't go on a continuous infusion. This is a readiness to extubate daily. Early extubation is the key for any patient who is intubated. Perform spontaneous breathing trials with sedatives turned off. It forms a part of our ex uh, extubation trial. Facilitate early mobility. So early mobility, so what happens is if the patient is able to move soon, so again, it basically tells us that their peripheral muscles and their respiratory muscles are strong enough to take over the load of breathing. Utilize endotracheal tube with subglottic separation ports uh, for patients expected to require greater than 48 or 72 hours of mechanical ventilation. So this is like continuous suction that is being used in order to prevent some pooling of secretion in the pericop area and also in the subglottic area and thereby preventing biofilm formation and also aspiration of the same. Change the ventilator circuit only if visibly solved or malfunctioning. So basically this is care of the respiratory devices. Elevate the head of the patient to 35 or 40 degree. The quality of evidence is low, but these are some of the basic practices that are being done. Special approaches that can be done. Uh, special approaches that can be done is selective oral or digestive decontamination. So there are instances we end up sterilizing or decontaminating our oral or digestive area. It is basically oral hygiene. And sometimes in cases like uh, hepatic encephalopathy, we end up giving refagot and other things so that there is some sterilization of the GI organisms also. So other special approaches uh, would be regular oral care with chlorhexidine. I think so. That is very, very beneficial. Prophylactic probiotics and again if it is a GI associated thing if there is a possibility of some aspiration of your gastrointestinal tract secretion prophylactic probiotics might help and it is a moderate recommendation these are all local recommendation depending upon your endotracheal tube ultra thin poly polyurethane endotracheal tube cups automated control of endotracheal tube cups saline installation before tracheal suctioning and mechanical tooth brushing and huh? they are some of the special approaches which we can do but the quality of recommendation is low there are a few recommendations which are generally not recommended which we may or may not do depending upon the availability okay silver coated endotracheal tubes that also is a plus or minus kinetic beds so the point is basically try to keep the patient position changing and either put them on the left lateral right lateral just try to elevate the bed position or reduce their bed position and they were try to maintain 
maintain uh, ventilation perfusion ratio in all the aspects of the lungs prone position especially in ards and also prone positioning is having a lot of importance now in this corona season where they are telling active proning active proning is the patient is awake itself you are supposed to prone them change their positions very frequently stress ulcer prophylaxis which i already highlighted early tracheostomy this is again a very dubious thing okay early tracheostomy especially in individuals in whom you expect them to have a intubation or a ventilator support requirement for a very very long period of time especially neurological patients uh, neuro patients okay monitoring the residual gastric volume i don't know how it is done okay and early parental nutrition as i mentioned before along with your uh, stress ulcer prophylaxis uh, encourage people to take nutrition as soon as possible if the patient is intubated i think so starting a rise tube feeding as soon as the endotracheal tube is put in place within 2 to 4 hours is beneficial and uh, there is no recommendation for a uh, few things like close inline endotracheal suctioning which may or may not be used but the quality of recommendations are moderate now coming to the approach of two treatment see approach to treatment takes two important things one is uh, okay uh, approach to treatment uh, depends upon two things one you will have to diagnose that the patient is having a ventilator associated pneumonia or hospital acquired pneumonia then you'll have to isolate the organism about what is the organism that is causing ventilator associated pneumonia and third is the treatment aspect starting from empirical treatment to definitive treatment so clinical diagnosis is difficult because there it is non-specific and it is overlapping idsa recommends have uh, hospital acquired pneumonia when there is a new lung infiltrate and plus there is a sign of infection the sign of infection may be in the form of a new onset fever or your secretions or sputum turns a little purulent you end up doing a total counts and there you see the total counts has increased a little or there is a decline in oxygenation so these things are very important and this is a uh, basis for clinical diagnosis so all these if you end up taking all these things into consideration it is 69 percent sensitive 75 percent specific positive likelihood ratio is almost up around 2.5 negative likelihood ratio is around 0.06 this is a recommendation for ventilator associated pneumonia ventilator associated pneumonia it may be all these symptoms may occur gradually or sudden onset more than 48 hours after intubation the symptoms are one is dyspnea basically the person is intubated and so when the person is intubated he won't be able to communicate or tell you the symptoms so if the patient has increased work of breathing and so usually non-verbal communication uh, in the form of increased work of breathing or if the patient is having visible distress or on mechanical ventilation there is increased ventilator requirement support requirements second thing is all your signs we'll have to look into fever here tachypnea here and increased or purulent secretion in the endotracheal tube if there is a hemoptosis hemoptosis we need to differentiate from pulmonary edema especially cardiogenic pulmonary edema if there is increase in the ronchi or crepitations if there is any reduced breath sounds reduced breath sounds might suggest there is a pleural effusion or there might be an endo endobronchial secretion accumulation thereby reducing airflow into those areas or some amount of bronchospasm we have to look into all those indirect clinical signs or uh, clinical signs to indirectly determine that might be VAC. Ventilator mechanics uh, suggest that there is a reduced tidal volume or increased inspiratory pressure requirements, in, increased in, inspiratory pressure uh, readings. Laboratory findings are worsening hypoxemia and increase in the total count or leukocytes. And imaging is you do a chest X-ray or a computerized tomography in order to find out that there are new onset infiltrates in the chest X-ray or the CT might be suggesting towards ventilator but pneumonia. And third important aspect is these are all clinical related things. Microbiological diagnosis. Microbiological diagnosis is culture of the pulmonary secretions. We need to have a culture of the pulmonary secretions. Either it can be sputum in the case of hospital acquired pneumonia, endotracheal aspirate, or a bronchoalveolar lavage. Bronchoalveolar lavage can be of two types. One is your mini bulb, what we end up doing, which is non invasive, intubated, we end up doing a mini bulb, or a definitive bronchoalveolar lavage after getting a CT done, isolating which is the uh, part that is infected, and end up collecting secretions from that specific lobe. And after collecting these samples, there are two sorts of cultures what we can do. One is your quantitative endobronchial uh, aspirate cultures or your semi quantitative uh, cultures. Your quant quantitative endobronchial aspirate cultures, 
has a pool sensitivity of around 48% and a positive predictive value of almost 81%. And your quantitative bronchoalveolar lavage, basically, if you end up doing a lavage, the sensitivity improves to almost 75% from the 48%, and the positive predictive value is almost the same. It is around 81% in uh, endotracheal aspirate to 77%. So, wherever a facility is available, when there is a new onset VAP, okay, getting a bronchoalveolar lavage for the diagnosis per, uh, per se is much, much better than taking an endo, endo, endotracheal aspirate. See, in places where we don't have a bronchoscope, what we can end up doing as a substitute is getting a mini bar done. Again, it becomes non-specific, but definitely it can be useful if you do a semi-quantitative uh, analysis as such. And there are newer diagnostic modalities that are available, that is molecular diagnostic tests, uh, which ends up telling about your uh, bacterial species, your viral species, and also uh, ends up telling you about the resistance by analyzing the genetic pattern. It is more rapid, it is more comprehensive, but there is one caveat to this. It can't differentiate between colonization and infection. Okay. Now, these are the different aspects. I told you there is clinical approach. Okay. And coming to this one, what has been suggested has is two forms of uh, diagnosis. One is based on clinical approach, how to start with the treatment. There are two graphs here. So there are two graphs here. If there is uh, one of the things is clinical features suggesting of ventilator required pneumonia. A person has come, has already got intubated, person is developing some amount of new onset infiltrates. If the person has ventilator required pneumonia, then obtain immediate bronchial aspirates and blood cultures before starting or changing existing antibiotics. So one. Start empirical antibiotics immediately based on the risk factors, time of onset, and lo local epidemiology of MDR pathogens using the ATS guidelines. If there is a positive culture, adjust the antibiotics based on the culture results and clinical response. If there is no positive culture, stop the antibiotics if low clinical probability or no signs of severe sepsis. This is a clinical approach. And a person comes to the hospital and he is already got intubated. There are some nuanced infiltrates. Blood counts are increasing or secretions are becoming more turbulent. So whenever you change the antibiotic, so whenever you change the antibiotic, you are supposed to get a culture of the uh, bronchial aspirate and the blood culture. And empirical antibiotics are based on initial empirical antibiotics are based on risk factors, time of onset, and MDR pathogens. And uh, if you get a culture, immediately try to tone down the antibiotics to a more specific thing rather than going for a generalized approach. The one. more approach that was Okay, that is the clinical approach they ended up telling. Okay, this is the investigational approach. So basically what they end up suggesting is clinical features suggestive of VAP 
hmm? if that is there then immediate something of the distal airways for bronchoscopy by bronchoscopy by doing a bronchoalveolar lavage or a protected specimen brush before introduction of new antibiotics so immediately after you end up taking it direct specimen examination after you see a direct specimen examination if bacteria is present characterize the bacteria as gram positive gram negative rods uh, uh, cocci or bacilli and based on that one start of antibiotics immediately using direct specimen examination results and local epidemiology if bacteria is not present if signs of severe sepsis are present then definitely continue with the antibiotics immediately using ats or idsa guidelines if there is no signs of severe sepsis observe or look for another infection if you end up finding another infection okay positive quantitative cultures you end up getting it select antibiotics based on culture results if positive quantitative cultures are not available look for other sources of infection basically what they are trying to tell is in places where bronchoscopy is available getting a ball or a protected specimen brushing done as soon as possible is very very beneficial and what they are suggesting is gram stain gram stain becomes a very very important tool in order to get to know what is the quality of the specimen and what are the bacteria that is present okay once you get to know the bacteria based on your local antibiogram we can start with specific antibiotics and tone down later when we end up getting the uh, definite positive quantitative uh, quantitative culture this is a very very busy slide i'm just trying to highlight one aspect here okay so i'll just read out the things hello so I continue? yeah please ah. continue ah. so basically the point is this is a very busy slide the point is uh, the font is very less i'll go through that one uh, one by one okay if there are uh, coming from here if there are uh, any risk factors for mdr back i already told you the risk factors that are there. this is for ventilator associated pneumonia iv antibiotics used within the past 90 days septic shock at the time of ventilator associated pneumonia ards preceding wap more than 5 days of hospitalization prior to wap or acute renal replacement therapy prior to wap onset okay if there are any of those following factors if it is yes for that okay uh, as i told you the possibility of uh, pseudomonas is on the higher side so as per rule pseudomonas does not require one but two antibiotics okay you'll have to cover for pseudomonas and there is a high possibility of having a mrsa also so you will have to treat with two antibiotics for pseudomonas which has a more gram negative coverage and also gram positive coverage in the form of vancomycin or linezolid okay so what we try to suggest or what was suggested was piperacillin tazobactam of almost 4.5 gram every 6 hourly or a cefepime 2 gram every 8 hourly septicidem 2 gram every 8 hourly imipenem 500 mg every 6 hourly meropenem 1 gram every 8 hourly or estionam 2 gram every 8 hourly that is one of the antibiotic groups that is supposed to be selected second antibiotic group will be amikacin 15 to 20 mg per kg iv daily or a gentamicin 5 to 7 mg or a tobramycin 5 to 7 mg per kg daily or your respiratory quinolones like levofloxacin sometimes you can use moxifloxacin or in some instances a ciplofloxacin or uh, this is the two group of antibiotics and along with that either vancomycin in the form of 15 mg per kg body weight to a maximum of, of around 2 gram per dose initially for every 8 to 12 hours is supposed to be given or linezolid 600 mg every 12 hours so what i am trying to tell here is if there is a strong possibility of pseudomonas or an mrsa you are supposed to take two antibiotics for, for pseudomonas and one antibiotic for mrsa so if the risk factors are present if the risk factors are not present okay this is the risk factors are not present so there is a possibility that uh, risk factors are not present but you are working in a setting where uh, almost 10 percent of your gram negative bacilli aspirates or isolates whatever are there are resistant to the monotherapy you end up giving initially if that is the case if it is yes sir, then you'll have to assess whether the staph aureus isolates have are uh, methicillin resistant or not if there is methicillin resistance not seen then you can go with only two antibiotics in order for gram negative coverage if a methicillin resistance is seen like in this chart okay you can go for one antibiotic coverage okay for pseudomonas along with a 
coverage for staff areas. So this is one thing. And, or if you end up working in a unit where the isolated gram negative batch fly uh, is less than 10%, less than 10% of the isolated gram negative batch fly are resistant to the drugs that are considered for monotherapy, then you can go for one only single uh, antibiotic as such, and you don't have any risk factors for MDR VAP, then you can go for a single agent antibiotic either in the form of Piperacillin Tazobactam, Cefepine or Libofloxacin. Okay, I'll explain it once, ag once again. If the risk factors for MDR VAP is present, then definitely go for two antibiotics for Pseudomonas, one antibiotic for MRSA. If the you end up looking into your local antibiogram, you look at two things. Again. One, your gram-negative bacilli, whatever are there, if more than 10% are resistant to monotherapy, what you give initially, then go for two medicine medications of, for Pseudomonas. So that becomes a risk factor for your MDR VAP. Okay. If there is uh, antibiotic isolation, whatever uh, your an uh, local antibiogram and staff aureus that is isolated, more than 10 to 20 percent have methicillin resistant, opt for a methicillin, uh, opt for vancomycin or linozolid. If there is no resistance as such, then you, you need not opt for that one. Okay. And if there is none of these risk factors, it is a simple VAP, then you can go for either a PIPTAS, cefepime, or a levofloxacin. This is for ventilator required pneumonia. This chart is for hospital acquired pneumonia. So when the patient is having a hospital acquired pneumonia here, what we are trying to do is prevent him from going to the ventilator. He is not in the last stage. We are supposed to prevent him from going to the ventilator and a person with hospital acquired pneumonia going for a ventilator will definitely have a poor prognosis when compared to a person who is not going to a ventilator or a hospital acquired pneumonia with associated septic shock will have a poor prognosis when person to who doesn't have a septic shock. So if there is uh, increased risk of mortality, if it is yes, then the treatment is almost similar to ventilator acquired pneumonia. Two medications for pseudomonas, one medications for MRC. Okay, along with that, you end up looking into something. Has the patient received IV antibiotics within the last 90 days? As I told you, it is a high risk factor for MDR pathogen. So definitely go for the same treatment. Two antibiotics for pseudomonas, one antibiotic for staph aureus. If the patient has not received antibiotics, then you think about one other aspect. Has the patient, does the patient have any structural lung disease or is the patient at an increased risk of having a gram-negative infection like a structural lung disease or previous isolation of MDR pathogens? If it is yes, then you can either go for a triple regimen, two medications for pseudomonas and one for MRSA, or you can go for just two medications for pseudomonas depending upon whether there is a prevalence of MRSA in your local hospital or not. Okay. If there is no structural lung disease or no previous isolation of gram-negative vaseline, then you can go into the following two categories. You will have to think whether MRSA is isolated in your hospital. If it is isolated, then, okay, if it is isolated, then you go for one pseudomonas antibiotic and either a vancomycin and linozolid for MRSA or if there is none of the risk factors that are mentioned then you can go for either for a piperacillin tazobactam, cefepine or a levofloxacin. Okay I'm being clear first important question you are supposed to ask is are there increased risk factor for mortality if there are increased risk factor for mortality go for three antibiotics. If there is no increases for mortality, look at whether the patient has received antibiotics within the last 90 days. If he has received, then go for three antibiotics. If he has not received, then look for any structural lung diseases, means suggesting there might be colonization. If there is a structural lung disease, ask a question whether MRSA might be a possibility. If MRSA is a possibility, go for three antibiotics. If MRSA is not a possibility, go for two antibiotics for pseudomonas. And if there is no structural lung disease, has not taken antibiotics within the last 90 days, then ask one more question whether MRSA might be present or not. If MRSA is present, one antibiotic for pseudomonas and one antibiotic for MRSA. If there is no possibility of an MRSA and there are not many risk factors present, then only one antibiotic for pseudomonas. Okay, so this is the chart. So after doing a treatment, you end up starting them on uh, definite empirical antibiotic therapy. You are uh, continuing empirical antibiotic uh, therapy for around two to three days. The microbiologist is very good. He tells you something with regards to your gram stain itself. You have a look at the gram stain, then you get to know the organism. You end up putting our, uh, therapy based on that. Or at the end of third day, you get a culture report. And based on that one, you change the 
antibiotic therapy, whatever you are putting. Okay, so from here, there are two things what you have to think duration of treatment. So, there are studies that were done telling that duration of treatment of seven days is almost equivalent optimal antibiotics. Optimal and antibiotic therapy for a duration of seven days is almost equivalent to a 14 day antibiotic therapy or a broad spectrum antibiotic therapy. So, isolating the organism is very, very important and duration of treatment can be minimized. One. Second thing is switching over to oral medications. As soon as the patient condition improves, patient is extubated or the overall condition improves, we can switch over to suitable oral antibiotics as soon as possible. And the full duration of treatment can be 10 days or to a maximum of 14 days unless and until there are possibilities that the patient has an empyema or a lung abscess, then we'll have to increase the duration of antibiotics for around 21 days. Okay, these are the treatment concentration. So now coming to take home message, hospital required pneumonia or ventilator required pneumonia. The point is act soon, act as soon as possible because if you are not giving an empirical or a good antibiotic therapy, then there is no point of continuing the treatment and the patient will have increased morbidity and mortality. So appropriate empirical treatment is very, very important. It depends upon your local hospital antibiogram. Prevent which you can't treat. So try to do all the preventive aspects what are there in order to prevent a person from going into hospital acquired pneumonia. Taper medications as soon as possible. Antibiotic stewardship is very, very important. So if you are not tapering the antibiotics as soon as possible, you are overburdening the patient with unnecessary antibiotics. You are increasing the possibility of him developing an MDR pathogen later because what you do now will be reflected in the next 90 days in his subsequent hospitalization. If you ended up using all the antibiotics, definitely he'll have resistant pathogens. Subsequently, he goes to some other hospital. When they look at the previous antibiotic that is used, then definitely what they get to know is he might have a possibility of MDR pathogens or might be XDR pathogens also. And treatment subsequently is very, very difficult. Early extubation is the key for optimum management. So try to extubate as soon as possible, as soon as the patient condition improves. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. Avinash, uh, for the excellent presentation covering both hospital acquired pneumonia as well as ventricular pneumonia. Uh, uh, for the audio uh, listeners, if any other questions are there, please they can put into the chat box or they can ask directly to Dr. Avinash by unmuting themselves. Any questions? Okay, Avinash, uh, you are you you are managing already COVID patients now in your hospitals. What yes, second what type of secondary infection you are seeing there? Sir, as of now, uh, we have started treating for only the past four or five days. Mm -hmm. uh, four or five days to almost a week, and so not much of secondary infection. Whatever data what we get as of now is on the lesser side itself. And we have put them on empirical antibiotics, and we are continuing with the same. And uh, as far as the treatment protocols are concerned, sir, as already discussed, uh, uh, over uh, IDCCM, uh, uh, um, so IACCM uh, group. So what is being considered is your prophylaxis, basically, in the form of a DEXA, in the form of uh, uh, vitamin C, in the form of uh, drop, uh, low molecular weight heparin and uh, eicosprin. So those are the things what we are considering as of now. And uh, it's going on okay for the time being. Since it is a viral infection, there is always a plus and minus. So usually viral infections are self-limiting. They try, tend to taper over time. So in the meanwhile, if there is no uh, secondary bacterial infection that ends up coming within that time frame, I think so the prognosis should be better. But considering this is a novel virus what we are dealing with, it becomes very difficult to get to know or we don't have substantial data to tell what will work and what will not work. Thank you, Arata Avinash. Any questions from the students? What about daptomycin, uh, Avinash? Have you used daptomycin? No, sir, I have not used daptomycin, sir. I have not used daptomycin. Maximum I have gone is for colistin, uh, polymyxin B, and uh, I think so, that's it, Anya. Okay. Daptomycin I have not used. 
Okay, any, any questions? Okay, uh, if there is no questions uh, to Dr. Avinash, we will we'll close this. Uh, thank you, Dr. Avinash. It was a very excellent presentation. Uh, it is very difficult to cover both actually, and it was like a you know, uh, you should like a guidance for the students to select which antibody we used at right time. So it was very uh, emphasized very appropriately. Thank you so much for that. Uh, and we will use your slides for the for students, and also use this webinar link in the YouTube channel, so that whenever they want, they can listen this uh, when they are comfortable. Thank you, Dr. Avinash, for your valuable time. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, sir. Sorry for the technical glitches. All of a sudden, the oh. internet went down, the audio went down in between. Okay, I was using my mobile uh, hotspot. So I don't know, one message used to come, so the internet used to go off. So I used to cancel that one and then uh, uh, reconnect it. And, huh? Thank you no, very much, sir. No. Thank you for the opportunity given. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Avinash. Thank you.